I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Happy Monday, everybody, and welcome to the interview room. We are so excited to see you all. Show us where you're at tonight, and while you're doing that, I want to thank our mods for being here on a Monday evening. Miss Sophia, Molly Girl, Teresa M, Mimi J2, we absolutely love you. Is that right, Karen? It is. We're so grateful for our amazing mods. These are phenomenal ladies working so hard for us. And we're so grateful to all of you, our subscribers, our members, our Patreon members, all of you. Even if you're just joining us and just finding us tonight, welcome. Thank you for being here on a Monday night with us. We love you all. England's in the house, Georgia, South Carolina, Milwaukee, North Carolina. It's so grateful to see everybody on this wonderful beginning of amaz another amazing week. The Republic of Ireland. My grand, our granddaughter just danced over there. How fun is that? Cincinnati, Ohio. Beantown in the house. I'm representing with the old capital behind you. Mount Pleasant. I love it. Absolutely love it. Indiana, North Carolina, Chicago. Chi Town. Scotland, Scotland, the UK again, Milwaukee, and of course, wonderful, wonderful South Carolina, Sweden. <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> it's great to see each and every one of you tonight. And you know, as Karen and I, the only thing we ask is that you hit that subscribe button and you send it on to your friends through your other social media uh, networks so that our, con our uh, channel continues to grow. So, Karen, and by the way, if you, uh, all you guys out there watching, eat your hearts out. She belongs to me. She's been with me for many years and uh, I love her to death. All right, Karen, where are we going tonight? We, where, what are you thinking? Well, spoiler alert, we're taking you guys all on a drive with us, starting from Moselle to Almeida. And it happens to coincide exactly with the GM on Star Data that came out last week in testimony at the last minute, four weeks into this trial, before prosecution rested. And that data we have, what we did is we drove it ourselves. We went at, back out there and uh, you'll see that coming up. So, uh, you know, get your, get your glasses on if you need to, you know, be able to pick up all the little fine details that we're going to be showing you. T3 custom. I call shots. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that has a couple of meanings, doesn't it? You know, when, we all know what it means for your younger generation. That means get in the front seat. And so we're going to, we're going to ask you to put your seatbelts on tonight. Uh, because as you know, when we go through this, uh, we're just going to play it at first. It will, it will speak for itself. And then we're going to come back 
and we're going to do a little commentary to it because we caught some things that you've got to actually be there and see. Uh, they talk about it in the trial, but you you just don't quite get it until you see it. And so tonight, you're going to see it. And Buddy is here with us. This little ham hamburger over here, we took him to the beach this morning, and we took him off leash, and he's pooped. He is, and he is out. Not like hooligan pooped. He's <laughs> he's tired. Pooped. He's out of service. So if I can get him up here in a little bit, I'll show every, I'll show you uh, how he's doing. He's doing great. But um, a pup alert on that. When he wakes up, I'll bring him over. All right. So are you ready, honey? I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull us out. And we're going to put the video up. Guys and gals, feel free to chat amongst yourself as you're watching it. But we want you to see um, what uh, it looked like. And now think through imagining it in the middle of the night not only before the murders but after the murders when it's pitch black just before 10 p.m okay so here we go all right i'm gonna pull us out and we're gonna get started the house is right there this is the route that alex took and he gets up here, allegedly, and it is in this area up here where the phone is discovered on the side of the road, and he's doing 42. So right now, I am at 42 miles an hour. So just about five-tenths of a mile from Alex's house, right up that way. So Alex is coming down this way, allegedly, and just before this curb at 42 miles an hour approximately, this is the GPS location of where Maggie Murdoch's phone was discovered. Her body is five-tenths of a mile that way, her phone is in this area, in these woods. This is the road where he really started to pick up speed, coming back and going. And you could see this in the middle of the night, it would have been pitch black. To the right of us is Hampton County, and that's the direction of his property. Look, he's coming up to intersections. There would have been deer, there would have been possum, any kind of animals could have been out on this road. And if you look straight ahead, that is the cell tower that picked up his connectivity to this road. If you look at this cell tower up here, this is the one 
that they were talking about. And there's three sides to these towers. One, two, and three. And this is what the cast information provided the jury for this trial. But here it is, right up here on our left. This is the tower that was pinging his phone that night. What's going through his mind? I just murdered my wife, my son, allegedly. I'm driving down this road in the middle of the night to go see my mom, who's in advanced stages of illness, Alzheimer's potentially, but he knows he's laying out an alibi. I would submit to you that evening Alex Murdoch had the sense of mind to navigate these roads correctly, to get to his mother's house, to throw that phone out in the location we were just at, have those guns wrapped up in those blue tarps as the prosecution is suggested because of the gunshot residue transfer, take those guns inside of his mom's house and now they're gone. Blood transfer on his steering wheel in his Suburban that belongs to Maggie. How did Maggie's blood get on that steering wheel that night? This is all evidence we've heard so far. This is the entrance into Varnville. And I'm thinking the defense, the only thing they can try to do is paint Alex in a sympathetic character by saying he had a drug problem and things got out of control, et cetera, the, the financial. Well, he could be a sympathetic personality, but he's also very cold and calculated. And the night this went down, Alex went out of his way to make sure that he had the upper hand. So we're coming into Varnville. We're gonna to head towards the entrance of the Alameda property. So this is the road that Alec turned down to go back to his house. And right up here is that other cell tower that picked him up that evening. So I'm standing in front of one of the towers that picked up Alec Murdoch's cell activity that night. There's no doubt this tower got him because his property is right over here to the right, not very far away. There is no question that Alex Murdoch's phone connected to that network. And you notice this is the new pavement that I believe the district attorney, the state's attorney was talking about. SLED and all the other investigative agencies involved in this have done a fantastic job. And 
this is where Alec would have brought those weapons that night. And what's interesting is this way, about a mile cell phone tower that picked him up at this location, at this intersection. And give you an idea how dangerous this is at night, there's a dead deer right there.
911 when your emergency. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child just got badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 okay. Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Hurry. Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? Okay. Con of communication. Collison, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line, caller from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay. And did you see anyone? Okay. Is he breathing at all? No. No. Is she? Okay. Do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. Oh, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay. Is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay. And what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay. Did you hear anything or did you come home and find them? No, ma'am. I've been gone. I, I just came back. <laughs> Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Okay, what is her name? Mag Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. <laughs> uh, we're getting somebody out there to you. Me asking you these questions don't slow them down, okay? And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them is moving. So Stephen Smith, an openly gay young man, is discovered here at this spot. Let's look into that, shall we? Okay, so that's the uh, first part of this. Karen, give us some uh, idea of what your observations were there, and we're going to break this down. We're going to play through it, and I'm going to share what my thoughts were. But, honey, yeah, go ahead. wow, we've got a lot to unpack here, especially at the end, and we'll, we're going to put it together for everybody so you can see uh, where Stephen Smith where he was, um, where he was found murdered. Um, and we, it's a homicide, so we can say that, but let's go back to the beginning. And, you know, we, as we said, we did this drive, you could see, um, and some of you were, you know, at first we were like, well, let's, let's do it. The speeds on the roads that were laid out in the testimony from the GM OnStar data. And at one point, Chris is going, he's only going, I think like what, 60, something and that was the stretch of road that where they said i think he got up to 80 at least 74 but maybe 80 and he it, we were flying it was like crazy i told him slow down <laughs> forget it we're not doing that obviously we don't want to get a speeding ticket but just it just shows you this recklessness clearly in the middle of the night that alec was driving but maybe let's back up and do you want to go through the video 
or do you want yeah, to? Let me put and, it. And we'll just kind of. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's all right, Hunt. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, we can just kind of, you know, talk a little bit about it, set the stage a little bit more as the video is playing. Okay, so we left off at the end. We wanted you guys to kind of start thinking about, you know, the totality of this, right? Everywhere we turn um, in this area, in that area as a whole, it, it's like there's another body connected to something or at least a conversation about it. I mean, you've got now, you know, Paul, Maggie, you have Mallory, you have the caretaker, you have now this Stephen Smith, and it's kind of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then you start seeing how that little part of the world really is, and you realize it's abandoned out there in terms of no wonder these people if they're involved in other things, which we know so far, they're involved in Mallory's death. They're involved with Paul and Maggie and they're involved with the caretaker. Okay. That's four people. Okay. I've, I've not met a lot of families in just in, and we're not even talking about Steven yet. We're going to talk about him. So that would be five that we, and there are, uh, there's a lot more that Karen and I are starting to dig into here. I wanted to leave you with Stephen Smith to kind of show how some of these dots get connected. Because if you think about this, the testimony so far has been controlled. Everything that came out of the defense came out of the attorneys. And it and this is important to understand if you're to understand Stephen Smith's death. The night he died, Alec and his brother showed up at this alleged car accident scene, went under the tape allegedly. And, but before they had done that, had called his, the victim's father and said, we're going to represent you. No charge. Don't worry about it. And by the way, this is, I think, what time was the, the time frame on this, Karen? Approximately? 2015. In 2015. Yeah. And, and what time though in the morning do they show up? His, his, well, his body, Stephen Smith's body was found on Sandy Run Road um, at 4 a.m., I believe, so, by a, a, a passerby. Yeah, so now think about it. <clears throat> First of all, I've never seen a civil attorney show up just randomly at a, mur a, a murder scene. A civil attorney. Remember, they're civil attorneys. And... And, uh, you know, there's a lot out there. Okay. There's a lot out there. So you're, you're hundred percent right, Lee. His name and every true crime YouTuber, I'm going to encourage you tonight to take a look at the Stephen Smith case. There is a ton of information out there, but I'm going to give you a red flag right from the beginning. At 4 a.m., the Murdoch attorney team shows up as he's laying in the road. Now, I don't know about you, but my first question is, who called them? And now it, it shifted. So let's go back to the mindset of this whole situation okay and i'm not talking about steven right now we're going to talk about paul and maggie then we're going to talk about mallory and then we're going to talk about steven okay so the whole mindset according to testimony from maggie's sister 
is Alec makes a comment. And that comment is, I'm going to clear Paul's name. Wow. And guess what? There's another name that sounds like nobody paid attention to either, and it sounds like they almost cleared it. And I'm not going to mention it, but the, the folks in that area know exactly what's going on down there okay? in terms of in that circle of influence. So let's walk you through. The house is right there. Uh, the the drive here again. So right behind me, we left the front door. And what our intent was to find the longitude latitude of where this phone was thrown. And we found it. So that's where we took you. Uh, what do you want to say about this area, uh, Karen? It's just down the road from Moselle Farm. You can tell, you can see in the video, it's rural. Um, it's just a scattering of, of small houses. Looks like farmland. Um, you know, it's, it's flat. There's woodsy in, in a lot of areas. There's open fields in a lot of areas, but it's, it's small. And this is still the town of Islington. Islington has like less than a hundred people population, probably closer to 50. And so, you know, Maggie's phone is found literally down the road from the home where her and she and Paul were found shot to death. Um, and, you know, and where Chris is right now in the car is the path Alec took from leaving the house to going to his parents' house, Almeida, that evening. There. This is the route that Alex took. And he gets up here. So I'm doing about 42. Allegedly. And it is in this area up here where the phone is discovered on the side of the road. And he's doing 42. So right now, I am at 42 miles an hour. And look at the trees. So just before you, you, you come around this little bend, and then there's a second bend. And just before that second bend is where the longitude latitude was, according to the testimony of where her phone was found. Thoughts on where the phone was found, Karen? That's it. We're showing where it is. You know, and it's interesting. It wasn't concealed. It was tossed out the window. It was, you know, five tenths of a mile from where her body was. So there was n obviously no great pains taken to conceal it at all. It was just tossed. And it makes you wonder, what was Alec thinking about how this piece was going to fit into his alibi? I pull off the road here, and then you're, we took it back. So this is the actual visual now of leaving his front door. And look how close it is to his property. That time of the evening, nobody on the road. I mean, here it is in the middle of the day. Nobody's on the road. Very few cars. But imagine just slowing down now, pulling off to the left and chucking it out the driver's door. And that's where it turns. When the testimony is it turned, the plane, i.e. the phone picked it up. And so this is the spot right there is the longitude latitude. So just about five tenths of a mile from. Let me back that up for a second so everybody can see it. So this will be the longitude latitude and it's the approximate spot. 
So this is where the phone is discovered. Okay, in this area. So it could have been in the woods. It could have been on the grass. Uh, it was still pinging. So they were able to, uh, you know, pin it down. Now, was that intentional? What do you guys think? Uh, tell us in the chat. So I, I just thought it was, obviously it was intentional. And was it to throw them off as if, you know, some other dude uh, was involved in this? What, what came to your mind, Karen, when you, when you saw this? I think it was, it was part of what he was saying in this, you know, that he claimed that there were two shooters and neither of them were him. I think for some reason in his head, he concocted this to toss the phone on the side of the road, making it look like perhaps one of those shooters chucked it off the side of the road. Now, this is just my opinion because we don't know, we haven't heard, we don't know exactly uh, what he's thinking, what, what his intention was. Um, so that would be a logical guess at this point. Okay. So just about five tenths of a mile from Alex's house, right up that way. So Alex is coming down this way, allegedly, and just before this curb at 42 miles an hour approximately, this is the GPS location of where Maggie Murdoch's phone was discovered. Now, let me kind of weigh in here why I think that doesn't make sense in terms of two shooters or even one shooter, total stranger to the Murdoch family. <clears throat> that phone is such a critical piece of evidence that if this was a professional problem, i.e. somebody showed up on the, the property that night late knew what they were going to do or not necessarily late even you know before nine and it's a hit well why didn't they take paul's phone because if maggie had a phone which she did and paul had a phone typically in a situation like that they're not going to leave that kind of you know dirt behind for lack of a better term they're going to take both phones uh, because they don't, you know, they're trying to get rid of the phone. But what was interesting, and this is why Alec had to, in my opinion, had to add that he picked up the phone of Paul. He had to add it to his story uh, because he knew that he he got into Maggie's phone and deleted all the stuff out of her phone. But he tried to do the same with Paul's and couldn't get it done. So he had to have a reason. And quite frankly, he may have even known that he was taped FaceTime and that message, iMessage. And that's why he called... Paul's buddy that, you know, his friend, his best friend, almost immediately to try to call him and tell him that Paul was deceased. So I don't see this as a professional situation at all do, do, because there's just too many mistakes. And this is one of them. This is a blaring mistake as an, as an amateur who kills people. Uh, a, a person who understands it i.e. because he's a trial lawyer. But people don't realize after they commit these types of crimes, you can think about it till you get there. But I've talked to so many murderers after they've done it, they didn't realize the repercussions afterwards of all the extra things they didn't think about. And I think this is, uh, the phone is one of those things. What, what, what say you, hon? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, let's, let's be careful not to give him too much credit. Right. Um, yeah, clearly lots of mistakes were made 
And we do know that he was a prosecutor at one point, um, but I don't, it, it doesn't appear that he had lots of big trial cases. And, um, you know, mix in there, it admitted opioid addiction, all these other, you know, uh, personality things with him. And do, don't expect him to pull off a perfect crime. Clearly, it was, uh, he got caught in a lot of things. And I think what's interesting is, speaking of cell phones, his cell phone, he reset. He erased all the information on his cell phone. But what he didn't count on were the pings from the cell towers with his car and the OnStar system. You know, thank goodness technology was able to recover that. Yep, let's continue on here. Her body is five tenths of a mile that way. Her phone is in this area, in these woods. So I was looking for crime scene tape or any type of, uh, I know it was so long ago, but I thought, you know, sometimes that tape gets tied up in a tree. Uh, but this is definitely, the area where the phone was. This is the road where he really started to pick up speed, coming back and going. Now this is the road where he accelerated, I believe, wasn't there testimony, and guys keep me honest here uh, in the chat, was, wasn't it like 80 miles an hour or something uh, on his way back? he was flying but what i wanted to point out here is this area as a whole there is just so many there are so many places that if you have those guns where you can throw them or even pull over you know at a slow rate of speed going you know when he's leaving when he's coming back he was going a lot quicker right? 80 miles an hour. Thank you so much, you guys. Yep, exactly. So and on the way there, he was going 74, up to 74 miles an hour, which is still f flying. Right. I mean, I was, I was cooking and, but, you know, Karen kept me in the corral for a moment. You know, she, she was telling me, slow down. And you can see the trees going by. Watch the trees. And yeah. you could see this in the middle of the night. It would have been pitch black to the right of us. And, and it was, I mean, this is the middle of the day. You can tell there's not a light around. So the only light he would have had would have been on his Suburban with those headlights. And, you know, that's pretty risky in of itself. But maybe he, you know, didn't care at that point, right? He, he didn't care. So what struck me is what was going through his mind at this point, leaving the house. He'd just thrown his wife's phone. He's got the guns. And there was one intersection. Uh, I, I forgot to cut it into this piece here, uh, and I apologize, but... There's one intersection that he comes to and he's got to turn right and across the street is a church. And we talked about that. Remember Karen? It's like, we sure did. what was he, what goes through a man's mind in the middle of the night after you whacked your wife and your son and you come to this stop sign and it was a, it's a stop sign. It's two rights to get towards his mom's house. And at this stop sign across the street, you can tell there's a sign, there was a sign and it had a light on it. So I'm assuming at night it was lit. And we did go down there at night. We were there one night. It was pretty late and it is pitch black. It is pitch black until you start getting into town or close to a town. Uh, but out here, we're all of this just going down here. Um, you can't see anything. Thoughts, Karen? No, let's roll tape. Let's keep going. Is Hampton County, and that's the direction of his property. Look, he's coming up to intersections. There would have been deer. There would have been possum. 
any kind of animals could have been out on this road. If you look straight ahead, that is the cell tower that picked up. Okay, that first cell tower is on the left side in, uh, where that the highest tree is there. And it's just to the left of that highest tree. So that cell tower has a clean shot to that OnStar and to his phone pings. So as he got nearer them, and we heard testimony from the, the uh, CAS um, you know, layout with the cellular analysis uh, survey team, uh, this is an FBI unit, it's an FBI program. They're able to you know, push data into it. And so that uh, testimony that we heard with him going down this road, well, now we can physically see that cell tower there's one behind my truck, a you know, a couple miles back. There's one in front of my truck, and then there's a couple more. Uh, there were a total of three that we we scoped in on, uh, but there were a couple more, and we and we filmed all all of them. His connectivity to this road. If you look at this cell tower up here, this is the one, the first one that they were talking about. And there's three sides to these towers. One, two, and three, and this is what the cast information provided the jury for this trial. But here it is, right up here on our left. This is the tower that was pinging his phone that night. There it is, clear as day. So hopefully they'll do, you know what would be really cool in this trial? is to take the jury out for a drive, put them in a marshal's van or a, a sheriff's van and take them on the drive. That would be extremely effective in driving this home. Take them to the scene, take them to the drive, take them to the property where all the evidence was found, take them to where the phone was found. I think that would be really compelling to anybody i mean with all of us just watching this you it now makes sense when the testimony is well we were picking them up on towers well there's the tower right in front of you and there's no question that the you know what's the defense going to say oh the cops put the tower there <laughs> wouldn't surprise me but you know special agent from sled you know quote of the day I, i'll tell you it's, it's, it's going to be the quote of the year time magazine the best confessions i ever had came from defense attorneys i love that guy that was so good karen thoughts? let's go let's go back on the let's keep the drive going let's keep going <laughs> okay she keeps guys There's one of them. What's going through his mind? I just murdered my wife, my son, allegedly. I'm driving down this road in the middle of the night to go see my mom, who's in advanced stages of illness, Alzheimer's potentially, but he knows He's laying out an alibi. I would submit to you that evening, Alex Murdoch had the sense of mind to navigate these roads correctly, to get to his mother's house to throw that phone out in the location we were just at. Have those guns wrapped up in those blue tarps as the prosecution has suggested because of the gunshot residue transfer. Take those guns inside of his mom's house and now they're gone. 
blood transfer on his steering wheel in his Suburban that belongs to Maggie. Okay, guy, I don't know about you guys, but that's, that's huge evidence in his Suburban while he's driving. Her blood is on that steering wheel, guys and gals. We all know that. And and I know that the prosecution or the prosecution is rested, but on rebuttal, they could do the, let's take the jury out. You know, so they still got a chance that they could do it. If anybody knows them down there, somebody put a little bug in the prosecutor's ear. Should do a, a site visit with the jury. They're extremely effective in these types of cases. It would it would require some resources in terms of, you know, security and shutting some roads down, but that's not an issue. You can do that. It's not an issue. But he's ha he's got this whole drive going on here. What's going in his mind? What's going on in his mind? He's racing to his mother's house with the potential murder weapons, allegedly. Right, Chris. And not only that, not only are the are the murder weapons potentially by him, sitting by him on, in the car, but what about his clothes? Where did the clothes go? We know he changed. We've never found the clothes. What was in the car with Alec Murdoch driving to his mom's house at this point? Yeah. And I mean, I guess, you know, there's a lot of what ifs, you know, we could what if this thing all to death, you know, people I've, you know, she had a bloody nose, you know, and all this other stuff. She had a cut finger. Okay. Well, did that blood was found that night, you know, in terms of it was, you can bet they, they, they caught that blood quickly. And so now the pro the defense would have to, you know, we could speculate all day long. And this is the other thing I loved about that detective, the testimony from SLED, where Hooligan was driving the, the truck, i.e. the narrative. You realize he's driven the narrative about everything. And I hope people are also remembering that when SLED went over to the house, there was a wall of lawyers in there and they were talking about the timeline. There was testimony to that. And they were talking about strategy. So he surrounded himself immediately with his friends, his firm, and all of these lawyers, which is not a bad thing because it could work and it seems sometimes it works. But the other side of that coin is when you start looking over your glasses at a state's witness and badgering them because you know the guy can't see the medical records because of HIPAA, anybody with common sense knows that to be true. They know it to be true. Alex graciously probably led him to think everything was going as planned as he left his mom's house. Yes, exactly. Oh, I can't see the word underneath, but it looks like uh, grandiosity. Uh, his sick mind, he had no worries. That's correct. I agree with that 100%, 99 pink balloons. And we always love you coming in here and thank you. And that picture is Leticia Hernandez, one of my very first homicide cases I ever worked. December 16th, 1989, she was abducted out of her front lawn. Thank you for always remembering her. How did Maggie's blood get on that steering wheel that night? This is all evidence we've heard so far. This is the entrance into Varnville. And I'm thinking that... The what can you tell us about Varnville? Small town in Hampton County. Um, its population is about 1,700 people. Barnville is um, small, and the it's kind of, it's interesting because the property where uh, that Alex's parents, his mom and dad, Miss Libby is his mom, um, 
where she obviously his father died three days after these murders, but um, it's the property. They call it Almeda because it's on Almeda place. And it's literally, as you saw in the video, it's you go over the train tracks and it's a piece of property there. It's private. We couldn't drive onto it. We could just get sort of as close as we could staying on the public roads. And, you know, it's closer to downtown. They actually had like a, a few small little buildings that and maybe a gas station that was a downtown, like downtown Varnville. Um you know, it's, it looks peaceful, it's rural, it looks quiet, and it's got a similar feel to the whole area, to Islington uh, and Hampton as well. It's much smaller than Hampton. Hampton, South Carolina is the town where the Murdoch Law Firm was. Uh, well, it still is, but his name's off of it. They call it something else right now. But um, yeah, what you see is what you get in this little town of Varnville. And uh, the properties have been sold. Um, the beach house is up for sale. I think uh, Moselle, the hunting lodge, I don't know if, if somebody bought that, but it was on the market. And then the other house that they sold before they moved into the lodge. So, And his name is taken off of the firm. They're trying to rebrand the firm. They but are. It's, it's now it's now called Parker Law Law Group. I think it's yeah. called Parker Law Group. Oh. Yeah. And and one drop of blood. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because the other drops were laying on the ground by the kennels. The fence, the only thing they can try to do is paint Alex in a sympathetic character by saying he had a drug problem and things got out of control, et cetera, the, the financial. Well, he could be a sympathetic personality, but he's also very cold and calculated. And why did I say that? Because I believe it. Just looking into the Stephen Smith case, in as short of a time that we have been, I, I can't wait to blow the doors off of that. That mother deserves justice. She's been waiting for somebody to help, and I will gladly introduce her to the Cold Case Foundation and give her hundreds, a couple hundreds of experts free of charge absolutely would love to help her and their family because that that one that one um, stinks and the night this went down Alex went out of his way to make sure that he had the upper hand So we're coming into Varnville. We're gonna to head towards the entrance of the Alameda property. So this is the road that Alec turned down to go back to his house. And right up here is that other cell tower that picked him up that evening. So I'm standing in front of one of the towers that picked up Alec Murdoch's cell activity that night. There's no doubt this tower got him because his property is right over here to the right, not very far away. That tower is so obvious and it's right near the property again. But it's there definitely is on the no road. Question. And here's another one. Third. That Alex Murdoch's and this phone. This is where the pavement changes. They were talking about it was that, far up. You can tell it's brand And you new. notice this is the new pavement that I believe the district attorney, the state's attorney, was talking about. Sled 
and all the other investigative agencies involved in this have done a fantastic job. That's my opinion. Thank you. So what's interesting about this, and Karen and I, I mean, we've lived in South Carolina for five years, um, and so we know that there are gators everywhere. They can be anyway. And what's interesting about this is this swamp area here, uh, he, he passes it going and he passes it coming back. Now, if he had that weapon, this would be a really good area just to kind of toss it. Now, I'm not thinking he did because at the rate of speeds he was going, it's too risky for the gun itself to get hung up in the trees or something like that. It would have to be, you know, he'd have to have a, a slow, you know, methodical pass through there to toss that weapon. Uh, into the swamp. But it's possible. So we just kind of leave that out there. What did you think of the swamp area, Karen? I was very surprised to see swamp so close to Alex's house and on this drive. I was taken aback. I had no idea. I, you know, we, we didn't hear about it. Specifically, we heard about the route. And yeah, I think this is, whoa, because it's such a great hiding place for anything, really. Yeah, it 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 is. I mean, when you look at it, look at the, look at this, look at it. I mean, it, this is swamp, and it's on the way. And this is where to his mom's property, and that's her. That's the family property behind me, right there. It was private property, so we did not want to, you know, violate anything and walk on anybody's property. We stayed on the road. But Nancy Grace made an interesting observation where she talked about, you know, all the being there at night, all the animals, you know, deer, possum, raccoons, et cetera. And she was 100% on target because across the way from where I'm talking at uh, there is a dead deer on the, on the side of the road. Um, and so... You know, it it was it would have been dangerous late at night, and everybody knows that. Alec would have brought those weapons that night. And what's interesting is this way, about a mile cell phone tower that picked him up at this location, at this intersection. And give you an idea how dangerous this is at night. There's a dead deer right there. There's that deer. See it to the uh, right of my shoulder there? Just laying there. So apparently, you know, they pulled it out of the, the intersection there and just laid it down, which is not uncommon. And that thing was large. It wasn't they have a small swamp one. Deer. It was good size. And South Carolina has swamp deer. A yes, lot of they them. they do. A yep. lot of swamp deer. We used to have them at our house. They'd come we sure in. Did. Yeah. And, and that, that, they're a little bit they're small, the deer. Swamp deer are a little bit smaller size than like regular deer. Um, the one that you, you over Chris's shoulder there, and if you could see it, it looked fairly good size. But yes, they're all over. They're all over the, the low country um, wetlands and swampy areas, marshy, yeah. marshland. Mm hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, oh, yes, we have lots of deer. That's right, Brandy. South Carolina has a lot. South Carolina has everything. Let me tell you, this is a beautiful state. And these roads prove it. I mean, they're, they're country roads. There's nothing there. There's so many cool things. When you come around a corner, there's this, like, you know, history. It's all there in South Carolina. Guarantee it. And now they're going to get, hopefully, rid of some problems. There. 
There are alligators too. So I want this is the road where he picks it up. This is the one where he just starts to jam. Coming out of his mom's driveway there, turn right, and he he floors it at about 80. And right there you see the sign. It says Hampton four miles. So he's not far from his mom's house and he's now cooking. And by the way, I'm only doing like 60 here. So add another 20 onto that in the middle of the night, close to 10 p.m. There's not a street light around. He's cooking. Now, as you come in a little bit here, at night, I'm assuming there's gonna be lights on these buildings, maybe cameras. Um, I don't know if they, they came down this far. We didn't hear testimony of that. But the South Tower uh, put him right where he needed to be. And also there's a water tower up here. Sometimes those water towers on the right have repeaters. And so your signal goes to that repeater and then kicks it back further along. So as you pass it, it also pings you. Yeah, he's cooking at about 80 on this road. And I've I've dropped down to quite frankly about 45 to 50 coming into this residential area. There's that tower right there or the water tower on the right. Now you're coming into our the Ville. I'm just gonna call it the Ville. And so you go down a little bit further here, and then you're gonna turn right. And you're gonna to go towards Dotson. You're gonna turn left, then another left. So he's rushing to call 911. So what's going through his mind, Karen? What say you? I have no idea what's going through his mind. Uh, he, we know he's he's stepping on it. He's gunning it, no pun intended, to get back to that property to lay out the next piece of his plan or what he thinks is his plan. And so he's in the middle of it right now on this road in the middle of the night, stepping on it to get back there. To, to have the rest of this plan and, and his story and his alibi to have it all try to come together. He knows at this point he's got to get back there and he's got to call 911. He's got to report the bodies and he has to get police over to his property. So what could be going through his mind? A whole bunch of things. Yeah, there's there's... He's got he's got nine one one on his mind right now. I got to get back there, stay within the time frame. You know, I got to create a little distance here. He's got an hour or thereabouts in that in that timeline. There, there's a gap there, and this is what he's doing. You know, he's cooking back now to get back to his kennels and make the phone call. No, the, a, a tower cannot ping your phone if it's off, but it can ping your OnStar. And that's what he did not anticipate. That's where GM found that data recently. Just last, you know, whenever it was, a week or two ago. Finally got it to him. Well, you have to wonder about that, too. It took him a year to, to do the original, I guess, scraping of it. And then two, three weeks into trial... All of a sudden, GM finds the most valuable and damaging data to the defendant. I'm still scratching my head over that. Every mile that system is speaking. Now you can see it. 
he's going down this road at 80 miles an hour. I, I would submit he's probably in the middle. He's going now back towards the house, thinking the next move. And his next move is going to be, who else can I fool? Allegedly. Who else can I uh, bring into the circle here? Oh, some guy with Navy SEALs. Here's the swamps on both sides. Oh, all these kids involved in the boat accident. Yeah, I could, I could get them involved somehow in this. I can throw the shade on them. That's men's rail. That specific intent, overt acts after he murdered two people. Now he's going to try to throw other people under the bus, which by the way, they did also in Stephen Smith's case. You're going to find that out soon. He's got to make the call though. Got to get back to make that call. Now, what's interesting is this terminology there. I've been up to it now. So he has brought this whole situation to a two-letter word. It. He's got his dead wife and his son, and they are it. I've been up to it now, and it's bad. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife? And you notice the dispatcher qualifies it by asking who they are. And your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am, they're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay, and did you see anyone? Okay, is he breathing at all? No, nobody. Is she? Okay, do you see anything? Do you see? Well, he's had a whole hour to think about that. I mean, he saw that his son's... Um, brain was laying next to his body so chris let me ask you this when the officers show up i'm fast forwarding here and murdoch says are they dead was that just part of his act well, of course he he's any intelligent human being especially a trial lawyer who sees their son's brain laying next to him and tells the cops. I think the most telling part of that whole scenario is on that body camera. The first thing he mentions is he starts selling, selling a narrative. 
And what does he sell? A boat accident. Well, and he, and he couches it first by saying, it's a long story. What? Yeah, it's a long, well, yeah. How does he know that story is connected to this story? Well, it just sounds like something very childlike if a kid was caught you know, doing something with their hand in the cookie jar or whatever, and they're trying to talk the person out of them being caught. Oh, well, it's a long story. You know, that's kind of what it it felt like. Right. And and what does he tell his sister-in-law? What's his number one goal? I'm going to clear. Go ahead. Paul's name. And he also tells her, whoever did this had been planning it for quote, a very long time. Right. Right. And he, he knows that the killer has been planning this a long time, but he doesn't know if they're dead. Soggy bread. And the other one that's always bothered me is he rolls Paul over allegedly his phone pops out, but he never goes over to see his wife and roll her over. I mean, the first thing I would have, you know, I don't even want to think like that, but any normal person would do that. If they have two of their family members there, I've seen multiples of family members. And you know, the Matthew Checky thing, I'll give that as an example 11 family members came into that bathroom. The cousins, the grandfather, the the mother, the uncles, they were all in there. And they were all, all over Matthew trying to help. And even to the point where they put a white towel over his neck, it was nothing they could do, but they were in shock and they were in motion to help their loved one. And what do we have here? I rolled him over and his phone fell out. So I picked it up. And then I thought I was going to do something. Well, I better not. So I put it back down. He didn't say, and then I rolled, I ran over to Maggie and rolled her over to check her. So either he knew she was already dead or she knew he was already dead. And he needed a reason to add the story, to sell the story. I hope this jury is paying attention to these minutia details. I really do. Anyone in the area? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? Look at that shirt. It still has a crease on it. Remember the housekeeper said she irons his shirts? Look at on the, the right side, on his right, where his right arm is. That's a crease. Look how crisp that shirt is. And that's the shirt he rolls Paul over in? Everybody look at this shirt, right? Doesn't it look starchy? You're right, Linda. It does look starched. Uh, I think that's just a shadow. Um, I don't think he's in this. Are you referring to the picture here? I, I, I think that's just a shadow. Yeah. Right. They said it smelled like detergent. And, and and you can bet you, I agree with you. I think there would, you know, be blood all over this thing, or at least from him leaning down to rolling Paul over because, you know, there's a lot, there would be, it would be horrific to do that. It would be horrific to do that. And Karen and I understand, and many of you do, Okay. This shirt tells you a lot. 
this is he's got the shirt on that's telling you it's a long story and then he goes into this dissertation about a boating accident meanwhile his family is probably what less than 20 feet maggie's to his left less than 20 feet maybe his son's in front of her by the shed by the by the uh feed feed area in the kennel where all the food is kept and he's as cool as a cucumber not a single tear and the other thing that uh we all know we we haven't heard him say who murdered my family he hasn't even used the word or let's go look hey hey cops go out there and start looking for who did this i think there's two shooters we never heard him say that ever even even when the dispatcher asked him just a minute ago is there anyone else out there he doesn't say well there could be or possibly or i don't know or maybe he says no there isn't really if somebody, if two shooters just killed your wife and son and you're out there in the dark, why wouldn't you have police check that? Yeah. And so, and remember when the cops showed up, the first officer on scene, we've seen the body camera, the shotguns laying against the, the truck. Okay. So. What's interesting here is the GPS data shows him going right down to the kennels. Yet he said he went back up to the house, got a weapon, and then came back down and told the dispatcher, right? Hey, I got to go get a gun. Or he introduces a gun. I think that's still even confusing. because, And the reason it's confusing because it doesn't make sense. Hey, and what, but what's really important here is he tells the officer, the sheriff that came there that night, hey, you probably want to unload that. Well, wait a minute. Aren't your family members deceased right next to you here? And you're telling the officer to unload a, a shotgun? When, if he's a target, i.e. his family, is a hit, guess what? Right now in that little white shirt, he's a huge target if they took out his other family members, allegedly. But he can walk around the farm and the hunting lodge like it's just another day, you know, on the farm especially with my two deceased family members laying here on the ground. And, you know, that in of itself tells you a lot. Remember, all behavior has a purpose. And this is a great, great case to learn what that purpose is. In fact, we're going to share this I guarantee you in our training at the Cold Case Foundation on what to look for. So he wants to talk about a boat incident and then tell the sheriff, hey, when you get a chance, you probably want to, um, you know, check the rounds in that gun and unload them. Um, yeah, there are no other shoes or Alex would have told his lawyer friends who showed up to, yeah. Yeah, and, and isn't that, that great is a great point. point. And, and not only that, everybody starts showing up uh, uh, to the crime scene. Now you, you correlate that with Stephen Smith and you go, wait a minute, did the Murdoch show up at four o'clock in the morning? And right now there's evidence that they did. There's evidence that they did. But who called them? Well, we know Alex. 
picks up the phone and calls everybody. So does that mean other people called Alex and his brother that night? I don't know. It's it's uh, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Uh, it's what? You can't see it from the road. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay. That's one of my favorite. In fact, I'm going to clip that as a sound effect going going forward. He just came from his mother's house. 80 plus miles an hour. And he sounds irritated with the dispatcher that she asked him if it was a mobile home. And all she's trying to do is get the units in there as quick as possible. That's all she's trying to do. And, you know, she's talking to him, obviously in the in dispatch training, when the person on the other line is hysterical, you know, you kind of go back to maybe, you know, kindergarten type language in this case, because she says to him, what color is your house? Right? So if it's a lost little kid, a five-year-old, whatever, you know, it, it's the same, the same kind of um, language to him. And, um, but obviously, yeah, in this case, and we've already talked about this, you know, he's, he has a presence of mind to be absolutely incensed by somebody asking, is it a house or mobile home? And then the next question is, what's your name? And then he states his name. So I kind of find that uh, humorous in a way, although this is not a funny situation at all, but. You know, Hillary has a uh, great point here. Humidity would have destroyed those creases fast in his shirt. That is a solid observation. Good job. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. That is really good. As we used to say, good ops. Good observation. Very, very good. Alex. And I wanted to remind everybody of the fake shooting scene as he's on the phone with the dispatcher. Not that dispatcher for the fake scene. This is the one where he's standing where his family is. So, you know, five steps to a sale. Remember, prospect, personalize, promote, create, and close. So he's selling. He sold this story. And then the attorneys cleaned it up for him and pitched the narrative to SLED. Remember, they were the ones that asked him all the questions and he just answered all the questions and SLED recorded them. And then they turned it on the SLED agent, senior agent. And turned it on to him that well, you know, hip, but you don't know, you know, you didn't get the reports. You didn't get the medical records. Uh, no counselor. It's called HIPAA. Apparently you didn't go to law school. Well, and again, you can only hope that the jury remembers that scene from the trial and just makes a note of it, you know, and, let, let's just right now give the jurors a little bit of credit for seeing what we all see, see right through a lot of this stuff. And really it's about, you know, the only hope you can have that they're seeing what we're seeing. So here's the fake shooting again, just to remind everybody. Explain the three minutes in the house before the 911. I can't personally. Uh, great question. Okay, did you hear anything or did you come home and find them? I've been gone. I, I just came back. Now, this goes into the theory, right, of a murder-suicide. He does, he does, he kills his family. And now he's going to go down this road and he's going to have either somebody kill himself because he doesn't have, you know, the chutzpah to do it himself because he's narcissistic, right? Narcissists won't kill themselves. They'll tell you all day long, I'm going to kill myself. 
No, you won't. I can't tell you how many narcissists I've talked off of bridges. I was a hostage negotiation room. Tell them the, tell them the Superman story, honey. <laughs> Can we finish this video first? No, tell them the Superman story real fast. <laughs> oh this God. is a good story. All right. So the, here's the Superman story. It's a true story. Chris and I had a day off of work. We were driving south on Interstate or Highway 5 in Southern California. And we, this is in Oceanside where Chris worked uh, and I as well. We, I look up on the bridge and there's literally some guy over the freeway ready to jump. And I tell Chris, hey, look at that. There's a guy ready to jump. And he's like, oh, man. So we pull off the road. We come around. And by then there were a couple of police officers. Some units had already arrived. And Chris hatches a plan because, okay, so this was our day off. But obviously these are Chris's colleagues who are pulling up to help this poor man who's trying to, or at least thinking about jumping to his death. So Chris goes over, has a conversation with uh, these other officers and uh, the sergeant. And um, so he comes back over and we were in our personal car. Chris comes over to the car and says, Hey, get out. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you got to get out of the car. Go wait over by the side. I'm like, okay. So he takes our personal car and he drives up to into the scene and to where this guy is ready to jump. And I'm going to let Chris tell that piece of the story because I was waiting on the curb. He was over there out of our car talking to the guy who was trying to jump. Yeah. And uh, Abby, thank you. Uh, I That was a facetious comment, of course, but, but they don't do it right off, right, you know, right from the get go. They, evident of the fact that we have this problem here. So I go over to this guy and he's hanging off the bridge and he's on the rail on the other side. And, um, I said, Hey, what's going on, man? And he looks over at me, he goes, who are you? I said, well, I'm a lawyer. Remember that question about the officer using trickery? Hey, uh, because trickery can save lives. Hey, and he goes, um, remember where he was talking about the two shotgun shells and, and all the guns and he tried to get Alec to slip up and he goes, um, you're a lawyer. And I said, yeah, what's, what's going on? He says, well, the cops have been after me and, um, I need a lawyer. I said, well, I can take care of it. You know, how, how, what can I do here? He says, well, man, he says, I'm going to jump. I said, well, that's not a good idea. How about if we do this? I can represent you. So let me go talk to these cops here and let me see if I can get them to back off. And what I'm going to do is go get my car and I'm going to pull it down. And you're going to, when I give you a, you know, the whistle, just jump in and come into the jump in the car. And the guy's guy, are you sure you're a lawyer, man? I said, I, do I look like a cop? He goes, no, nah, you don't look like a I, Then, okay, I got you. So I'm going to go tell the cops you're my client. And I need him to back away. Okay. So I walk over and my buddy, Kevin Kaiser, who's a sergeant at the time, I said, hey, Kev, here's the plan. And I got my back to the, to the guy on the bridge. And he goes, what are you up to? And I said, hey, he thinks I'm his attorney. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go grab my car and I'm going to pull up. And when I yell for him to jump over and jump into my car, wait till he gets to the seat. And then gleep him and hook him up, take him for an eval. He goes, Roger that. So I walk, I would go, that's where I went up there to Karen. And I said, honey, you got to get out of the car. And she's like, what? We're going to dinner. I said, I know, I know. Just get out of the car. It won't take long. And she gets out of the car and I pull up and I park and door opens. I go, hey, let's go. Come on, let's go now. And the guy looks around and he jumps over the, he comes back over the rail and gets in the, the passenger seat and the PD, you know, grabbed him and hooked him up. He turns to me, he goes, you're not a lawyer. And I said, you're right, buddy, but I just saved your life. So I got to go to dinner. And I said to, to Kaiser, hey, I'll write paper when I get, when I get back, you know, get him a 72 hour eval. So that reminded me of the fake ambush scene. 
so then wait 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 let's finish the story so then chris so he's chris is in the car he motions to me come on back we get in the car and i didn't hear or know any of what was going on he told me what happened and then i said okay i said well can we can we go to dinner and he's like yeah we'll I'll deal with the paper tomorrow or whatever and i said what are you superman you're swooping in saving a guy's life and now we're jetting off to dinner like nothing happened in the last 25 minutes so that's why we call it the superman story that's the superman story and yes i did turn him over to the pd who took him to the hospital and he and where we where we were in southern california at the time you know if you if you had a mental illness they we could take you where they actually have doctors who can help i'm a i'm a very big proponent of mental illness awareness and helping those folks get help and so yes they put him in um in a facility for for a 72 hour hold and they stabilized him and uh, got him taken care of so the good news is he's alive today he did not take his life and uh, we were able to go to dinner and i made some points with my wife as superman that night I wanted to put this in here so we don't forget no, what was the safe place for Maggie. This was her refuge. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Okay, what is her name? Mag Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. And I see one comment in here. Uh, Christy, you're right. Nobody needs to lose a child. But I think you're new with us here, so it's great to have you here. And if you have lost a child, God bless you. All right, now I have two thoughts on this. It's been quite some time. And I don't understand why there are no markers here yet. But maybe they were ordered and nobody could put them in. So, um, but this, did this not disturb both of us, Karen, when we got up there? at the cemetery it was very disturbing it left a lot of questions more questions than answers yet again and we don't know we there there should be you know a huge monument and what's really interesting about two three hundred yards away from their graves in the same cemetery is the murdoff family plot uh area and but it has his great great grandpa uh the randolph murdoch randolph murder Mur randolph murdoch thank you um who died in 1940 under those mysterious circumstances when he drove his car on the train tracks and the train came by and hit him so that you know randolph the first if you will is buried 200 yards away and there is a big headstone that says murdoch on it um we were left with a lot of questions about this absolutely yeah it was disturbing to see mom and son next to each other with no markers no markers and i wanted to remind everybody else the other victims that need to be remembered here that's the sweet mallory 19 years old, life tragically taken. They're not breathing. Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> and you see, that's interesting. The dispatcher, listen to that carefully. He said, my wife was shot. And 
I'm going to play that back. Listen to the dispatcher. And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them moving. He didn't answer the question. What about, you said she was shot. What about your son? Is he moving? This is a sad story. And Maggie's sister made sure that she testified to it. That his number one goal after this problem, the death of this sweet girl, was to clear his son's name, Paul. I think that pressure is one of the reasons that trigger was pulled. I really do. So Stephen Smith, and this is the next one that I'm going to encourage every true crime YouTube channel to look into the death of Stephen Smith. This young man needs answers. And if anybody knows his family, have his mother go to the coldcasefoundation.org and submit a request for assistance. We will run a parallel investigation outside of the authorities. I've heard that, pink balloons. I don't know that. You know, I think that's, it's a possibility, of course, um, but I don't know personally. Right? We've seen crazier things, haven't we? Haven't we? We sure have. An openly gay young man. So, Karen, break this down for a moment. Give everybody the Reader's Digest version of why we added Stephen Smith at the end here. Because we have Paul, Maggie, Mallory, Stephen, the caretaker. I mean, there's, there's like five bodies around this family. That's right. So just a real brief overview of Stephen Smith and who he was. Um, it, Stephen Smith was killed in, um, I believe that was July 2015. He was 19 years old. And he was studying to become a nurse, but had aspirations to become a doctor one day, according to his family. Um, now, Stephen went to school with Buster Murdoch. They were classmates. Um, and Stephen Smith, the, as the story goes, for what's been reported, he was driving, I, be, I believe he was driving home from classes at the college that he was attending, his uh, taking his nursing um, classes at. And he was driving home at night, and story goes he ran out of gas, and his car stopped. And this would be approximately three miles, just under three miles from this location that you see on your screen where the memorial is, um, the memorial cross is right there. So that's what we know. His car ran out of gas. Um, and th so his body was found in the middle of the road right here where the cross was. He had something like a seven inch gash to his head and a dislocated shoulder, right shoulder, but no signs other than that of being hit by a car. His shoes, his sneakers were still on his feet when his body was found. And apparently that's a telltale sign. If you, a person who's hit by, the, by a car, if it was a hit and run, uh, just the way inertia is, your shoes fly off your feet. They come off. So he's found in the middle of the road, 4 a.m., and a passerby calls police. And so, so at 4 a.m. on that day, 
there's a crime scene and I believe it was Hampton. It was either Hampton County Sheriff's or Hampton PD was the first to arrive on scene and or shortly followed by the highway patrol because apparently it, they felt it was a hit and run. Um, lots of mystery surrounding this. There's reports that at that crime scene that Alec Murdoch and his brother Randy, both attorneys, showed up and allegedly went under the crime scene, went into the, under the tape, went into the crime scene. There's a, there's a report on that, uh, or it's been reported. It's also been reported that um, Stephen's father, who was alive at the time, received a phone call from Randy Murdoch saying that he was he would be offering his legal services free to the family to represent them. Um, and apparently that was like the, that very day or the next day uh, after Stephen's body was found. Well, in subsequent days and weeks later, the law firm recanted that, that Randy Murdoch had ever made that offer at all. So there's a lot of mystery and a lot of questions surrounding that. So that's going to be uh, part of what else we're going to start um, looking into during this whole thing with the with the family here. And so so scared he grabbed gun, but not one of his dogs. That's um, a great point. Uh, I don't really, you know, are you asking a question? I don't quite understand that. Karen, do you understand that piece? Oh, she's just asking if you're so scared pulling up to your dog kennels and your two of your family members are shot dead um, that he would have grabbed one of the dogs, perhaps. Yeah. No, oh, I, great. Can see, I can see that that's a, a legitimate question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. So thank you so much for the for that. And um, I apologize for missing it earlier, but I caught it. Uh, and thank you. Uh, true cowgirl. We appreciate you very, very much as well. Um, all right. What a great night. Um, we got a path where we're going here and, uh, you can tell we're going to keep finding, uh, I'm sure additional things. Uh, the trial again kicks off tomorrow. Uh, come back on Wednesday. We're going to have, uh, Francine back with uh, Kevin and we're going to talk if you didn't know Francine was neighbors with Ted Bundy and Kevin wrote all the books about him and her son Ted used to babysit her son and we're going to have him on too Wednesday night so um It'll be a good one. It'll be a great one. Honey, you get the last word as always. Uh, I tell everybody I'm just Karen's husband. So when uh, we're done here, hope you guys continue to take care of each other. Uh, we are so, so grateful for each and every one of you who subscribe to our channel. And, you know, you, you kind of hate to keep asking it, but if you haven't, please hit that thumbs up to get the video moving. And also if you haven't subscribed, all we ask is that you subscribe and uh, help us continue to, to grow. And that way we can help others. And it does help us uh, out here, supporting us out here to do the things that we're doing. We appreciate you very, very much. Well, Karen is uh, going to talk here for a second. Let me go grab Bud and give everybody a uh, a buddy report. Hang on. <laughs> so as we all know, tomorrow morning, the trial continues with defense. We left off with them putting on their case. I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of bombshells and fireworks going off with that. And we'll be sitting there watching it along with all of you. I'm not going to put those on, but here's Budzo. But say hi to everybody. What's up? And he got a little, he had some work done. See the the mark here. Give everybody a report, Karen. 
he just, Buddy had a, uh, another EKG to check his heart, and they had to shave a little patch of his fur. Uh, but all is well. He's doing very well. He's doing great on his medicine. Buddy hasn't slowed down at all. He loves running after chipmunks, birds, all other playing with other dogs. He's been great. And as Chris mentioned, we, he's a little tired tonight. We took him to the beach earlier, but Bud's doing great. And uh, we're grateful for all of your love and your um, support of Buddy, your fun comments. Um, you know, we love we love fur babies of all kinds here. So uh, thank you for your love and support of Buddy. And we send it back to each of you and your sweet little fur babies as well. Aloha, everybody. Be Akamai and continue to take care of one another. We love you. Have a great evening. See you on the next one. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out. 24 7, babe. No, no timeouts. Wish we could fly away. You and I go to our favorite place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Make special memories together I'll be your company now and forever I say we fly away, you and me Go to our favorite place Feeling the sun on my face in a while Taking away, yeah, we're taking away. We'll never come down, we're going away.